And that brings us to a little bit about Dr. Esther McGinnis. She is our extension horticulturalist for Eastern North Dakota and the director of the NDSU Extension Master Gardener Program. Her research includes evaluating plants for rain garden environments, pollinator plant preferences, high tunnel production, and spotted wing drosophila in fruits. And as a food and nutrition specialist, uh, Esther and I often collaborate because food and gardening are directly connected. So with that, she is going to talk about trendy and healthy houseplants, and thank you very much for doing this this year. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to call Julie my friend. Of course, she would be my friend with Garden as her middle name. <laughs> but thank you for inviting me to uh, participate in your Field to Fork. I always enjoy interacting with your audience. Um, but we're going to talk about houseplants today. And growing houseplants used to be something that our parents did, or maybe you know, our mom, our grandmas did. But you know, now it's becoming really trendy, and we're seeing our millennials do it. Um, so houseplants are enjoying a renewed popularity for a lot of different reasons. I mean, they're very beautiful. You know, we have beautiful leaves. You know, some of the, the leaves can be multicolored. And, and we've got graceful flowers. And then we have unusual plants, our succulents, our cacti. So there's something for everybody. But another reason houseplants are enjoying renewed popularity is that they help us keep in touch with nature. And I would bet a lot of people in our audience are feeling like they're, they've got cabin fever. Cabin, cabin fever, we've been housebound for a big portion of the winter. We would love to feel in touch with nature. Now, if we can just surround ourselves with houseplants, that seems to help a little bit. Uh, houseplants are an important part of interior design. So, so if you open up an interior design magazine, you'll find that houseplants are, will be in a great, maybe a majority of the pictures. They're becoming a part of our infrastructure. Um, and then they help lift our spirits. But I want to ask a question of your audience. Now, master gardeners cannot answer this. Master gardeners have probably already seen this presentation. But I want to ask the rest of the audience. And Julie, I'll have you monitor the chat box. Who can be credited with reinvigorating the houseplant trend? And I'm going to give you a hint. It's a governmental organization. So I'd love to see some feedback in the chat box. And Julie, if you could read, uh, read some of the answers. All right, go ahead and type. Hipsters. <laughs> <laughs> Think more governmental. USDA. Okay. Any, others, any other um, guesses? And I'll tell you, it's not the USDA, so you can keep guessing. Martha Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> Martha does love her house plants. There's no doubt about that. Um, we also have HUD and EPA as guesses. Well, none of those are right. Here, I'll, I'll advance the slide here. It's NASA. And you may be asking, why NASA? Well, that's because we have the space station. And the space station is essentially a building that is tightly sealed. Uh, you now you can think about um, the space station as having all the things that we have. In, you know, they've got furniture, you know, maybe a little bit of carpeting. They definitely would have plastics and synthetic fibers and whatnot. And we know that a lot of our common furnishings and the finishes on different objects can off-gas indoor air pollutants. Now, we at home, we're lucky. We can open our windows, but we know that the NASA space station can't. It has to be tightly sealed. And we've known from news reports what happens when there's even a little tiny hole. They get very concerned. Um, so NASA decided to do a study to try and find out how can they remove some of these indoor air pollutants. So they turned to houseplants. And they looked at the ability of houseplants to remove five different classes of indoor air pollutants. Everything ranging from benzene to formaldehyde, TCE, xylene and toluene, and ammonia. Now you can imagine um, 
these are present in our houses because we have plastics and paints, carpeting and plywood, you know, and window cleaner. These are things that are commonly in our houses. Um, so NASA, NASA decided to look at common plants that grow in low and medium light situations to see if they would have the ability to filter the air. Now these are a few of the plants that were mentioned in the NASA study, and they showed that peace lily and Floris chrysanthemum removed all five of the indoor air pollutants to varying degrees. Snake plant, English ivy, and red-edged dracaena removed four uh, different pollutants, and even golden pothos removed three. But overall, you can conclude that most house plants remove at least one or two of the indoor air contaminants, and anywhere from one to three plants per 100 square feet is beneficial. The one thing I would caution you about are those that have allergies. Um, I, I would think twice about putting household, or putting house plants, um, particularly in your bedrooms, if you have allergies to mold and mildew. But one thing I wanted to mention before we moved on is that we're still trying to figure out how does NASA have the ability, or how, does, how do house plants have the ability to remove indoor air contaminants? Is it the leaves? Do the roots have an effect? Is it the potting soil or, or maybe even the microbes in the potting soil? And we're finding that they all play a role. We do know that the potting soil in general with its microbes play a very big role. So you're going to be seeing more and more research on this um, in the future, but I think it's a safe bet that including houseplants is a good idea in your house. We're, today we're going to discuss some other health benefits of plants. We'll talk about how to care for your plants and then specifically um, three or four genera of plant or three or four families of plants um, that do have these health benefits. So we'll start off with three or four different studies here. Um, this is a study from 1996 talking about plants in the workplace. Now you can imagine a computer lab, it doesn't have any windows. Now in this study they had two different groups come in and take a time computer task. They were able to control for variables, you know, such as gender and age and, and whatnot. Um, and what they did was, for the first group of people, they put houseplants around the perimeter of the room. For the second group, there were no houseplants. The two groups took the time computer task, and they found that the group that was surrounded by houseplants performed better on the computer task. They had 12% faster reaction times. Um, they also displayed lower blood pressure and reported that they felt more attentive while they were performing the task. Now we have another study done in 2008 regarding the job satisfaction of office workers. Now once again, they controlled for variables, you know, such as age and gender and salary and job description. And what they really surveyed was whether these individuals had plants in their office and whether they had windows. And then they looked at all, all the combinations of plants and windows. Now in this table, look at the mean score. A mean score of 108 or higher indicated more job satisfaction. Less than 108 was less a lesser amount of job satisfaction. So regardless of whether they had windows, the individuals that didn't have plants reported having lower job satisfaction than those individuals that had plants in their office. Now, I'm not going to tell you that house plants are going to make up for a bad boss. They're not going to make up for a lack of a pay raise or other, some of these other things, but they can help you incrementally improve your mood, and that's a good thing. So it's a good thing to be able to incorporate plants into your workplace. At school, they have done studies. The study was done in Taiwan looking at junior high classes. We had two classrooms side by side. In one classroom, they had house plants. The other classroom did not. They then looked at four different things. How did the, the kids perceive the classroom? You know, were they sick a lot? Were there punishment records? Were the kids sent for detention or sent to the office to meet with the principal? And then they looked at test scores. They found that the students that were in a classroom surrounded by plants scored uh, better in three of the four categories. 
So the students perceive the classroom as being friendlier and more comfortable uh, if they had houseplants. Remarkably, they had fewer sick leave hours in that classroom as opposed to the adjoining classroom without houseplants. And they misbehaved less, so there were fewer punishment records. Now, unfortunately, houseplants can't improve your test scores, but if we can improve three out of these four categories, I think we're doing really well in our schools. How about uh, nature and hospitals? Uh, the seminal research was done by Ulrich in 1984, and this has been a very important study um, to prove the, the importance of plants and nature in our health. So Ulrich did this study, and he looked at several years' worth of records, only during spring through early fall. Um, and these were all gallbladder patients. So we know that's, that patients that have their gallbladder, gallbladder removed have kind of a standardized treatment. Now, what changed is their hospital room. Did they have a hospital room with a window overlooking a courtyard with beautiful trees, or did they face a brick wall? Now, in looking at the records, Ulrich noted that there were more negative notations in the hospital records for those individuals that faced a brick wall. So nurses would note if the patient was crying, if they needed consolation, if they were complaining about pain. So these were the negative notations in the patient's record. There were fewer of these notations for the individuals that looked out over that beautiful courtyard. Um, in addition, those that faced the courtyard with trees took fewer painkillers. And if they took a painkiller, it was usually less severe meaning they were able to get away with taking an acetaminophen as opposed to taking a prescription narcotic. They also had shorter hospital stays. Now, surprisingly, uh, this study didn't really have a follow-up until 2008. Then we had Dr. Park and Dr. Matson. I think they were at, at Kansas, and they looked at what happens if we incorporate plants in the hospital room. Again, we had, we had a standardized surgery with standardized care. Um, the only variable was whether they were plants in the hospital room. So for the first group, they had 8 to 12 plants in the room. You know, they could, it could be foliage plants. We had some flowering plants. The second group had no plants in the room at all. So in both studies, they found that the surgical patients recovered faster if they were surrounded by plants. They took fewer pain relievers, had lower blood pressure, and they reported less pain and fatigue. So what are you going to do now? If one of your loved ones is in the hospital, you're going to buy them plants. All right, so we've talked about the benefits of plants. Let's talk about how to care for your plants. So I'm going to have some general comments first before we dive into specific plants. I think it's a good idea to do research before you bring the plant home. So figure out what their native habitat is like. Are they an epiphyte or do they grow in terrestrial situations? So an epiphyte would be like an orchid um, that lives on the branch of a tree and not in soil. A terrestrial situation would be where the plant is living in soil. They're going to have very different media requirements. Now look at temperature. Does a plant grow in a tropical location or does it grow in a desert where it may have cool temperatures at night? What about water and relative humidity needs? Think about light. Does the plant grow in full sun or is it growing in the shade of a tree? And then think about finally nutrients. Is this a plant that requires a lot of fertilizers or not? So some good things to think about before you bring the plant home. Now, once you bring the plant home, you need to think about watering. And this is probably the hardest skill that we have as plant parents. So how to water the plant? Well, the general rule of thumb is to water deeply but infrequently. Uh, so this means that you want to saturate the pot when you water it. How do you know if it's saturated? You look to see if there's water draining out the bottom of the pot. Uh, now, you don't want the water to collect for too long in the saucer beneath the pot. You know, after five minutes or so, you may want to dump out that water. Now, dump, dump it back on the plant. This, this water that came through the pot can actually be heavy in salts. So we don't want to put that back on the, on the plant. Instead, we want to dispose of it. 
So that's how to saturate the plant. But then you want to allow the soil to dry out in between waterings. So do you need a moisture meter uh, to check this? No, you have a moisture meter. It's your finger. Stick it in the soil about an inch deep, and then at that depth, feel the soil. Does it feel dry or does it feel moist? If it still feels moist, you may want to wait to water another day or two. Um, now, when it comes to watering, think about the time of year. I know there's some people that like to water once a week, but this is probably not the most, uh, the most efficacious way to do it. Instead, you need to water more during the summer and less during the winter. Again, be guided by your finger. You know, wait for the soil to dry out. It's going to take longer to dry out during the winter. Now, as for watering, there's special considerations for African violets. Um, we don't want to wet the leaves of an African violet. We know that if we do that, the leaves are going to rot. So it's better when you're watering to water below the leaves. And then finally, think about your water. Uh, a lot of us have water softeners, uh, particularly for those that live in urban areas. Uh, don't use softened water. It's better to use hard water if you can. The softened water, once again, has salts and sodium in it, and that can be detrimental to the plant. Now, other tips with houseplant care. You know, consider humidifying your plants that are native to the rainforest. You may have a, a room humidifier that can help. Um, an easy way to raise the relative humidity in the room is if you group your plants together. They'll kind of humidify each other as the water evaporates from the soil. Um, now, fertilizer. Fertilizer is like water. You want to fertilize more frequently when the plant is actively growing. So I tend to fertilize my plants more frequently in spring, summer, and early fall, and then I cut back or even stop during winter. Now with temperatures, houseplants struggle when the temperature is less than 55 or 60 degrees. This comes into play at this time of year. I know a lot of you like to travel. We probably have a lot of snowbirds too. Um, so if you're gone for a week, I know you want to turn down the temperature on your house. Don't turn it down so much that you're killing the plant. Um, other temperature concerns are, what if you're growing your plant on the windowsill? Um, it may be tempting to draw the curtain at night, but then you're trapping that plant between the curtain and the window. So this is going to be a, a pocket where it's going to be very cold. So if you have a plant on the windowsill, you may want to move the plant off the windowsill if you're going to draw that curtain at night. Oh, light is so very important. Uh, for most of us, we should consider buying plants that like low light situations or, or maybe medium, medium light. Um, I really would kind of shy away from high light or very high light plants, unless you're going to provide supplemental lighting. So I get a lot of questions, you know, what, what sort of lights? Do I need to buy a special grow light? Um, I, tend, I tend to actually recommend something cheaper than a grow light. I tend to tell people, go out and buy a shop light. So a fluorescent shop light with cool fluorescent bulbs. Um, these tend to work very nicely because it provides a broad spectrum of wavelengths. And, and that's good for the plant. Um, now you would hang your lights maybe, you know, three, four inches above the plants and then replace the bulbs on a yearly basis. Even if that bulb is still lighting up, we do know that light levels drop after a year or more. Now some of you may be wondering, should I go out and buy an LED plant light? And and I'll have to tell you, there's a lot of research going on with LEDs, uh, but LEDs are going to be different. You're not going to be buying an LED uh, bulb that's white. With LEDs, in order for it to work, you need to buy specific colors of bulbs. Uh, so that's why we see this particular unit that has red and blue bulbs. Um, this next slide will, will show you why. Now, plants do absorb absorb light all across the, the visible light spectrum. However, they need more light in, in the, the blue spectrum 
and they need more light in the red and then a little bit of, uh, of the far red. So that's why they're doing a lot of research to optimize the colors that we provide. Um, but you'll find that most of the LED plant lights that are on the market have both red and blue. But they're start, starting now to think, you know, do we need to add green? Do we need to add far, far red? So you're going to see a lot of change regarding this. We're just barely starting to scratch the surface when it comes to LEDs and what we need for our plants. All right, so now we've talked about how to care for plants. Let's talk about specific plant families. Did you know that plants have families like we do? They have cousins, in fact. Um, You'll find that these plants are related. Um, they're related on the genetic level, and they'll also have some characteristics where they, they look alike even. So we're first going to talk about the arum family. And the arum family lo looks alike in that it has flowers that are similar. So you'll see the flowers look like the peace lily in the, in the corner there. They have what we call a spadix. So that's that little column of tightly packed flowers. And they have a spathe, which is that bract that looks a little like a petal, but it's actually more of a leaf-like bract. All right, so back to the arums. And they can have these poisonous leaves. If you were to look at the juice from a leaf under a microscope, you would see these little crystals or little needle-like structures. Um, they're microscopic, but um, they have this potential to uh, greatly aggravate your tongue. They can even cause your throat to swell up. So this is why we don't want to eat leaves from the arum family. And we do, in fact, have quite a few. Yeah, let's try. We do have quite a few commonly grown plants in the arum family. It includes the peace lily, Chinese evergreen, Swiss cheese plant, dumb cane, philodendron, and golden pothos. So we want to make sure that we train our children not to be chewing on our plants. Now with our pets, it's a little bit harder. We may need to um, put these plants in a locked room or a room where our pets can't get to them or put them up high. So peace lily. Uh, peace lily is one I mentioned at the very beginning, having the ability to remove many different classes of air pollutants. Um, this is what I like to call the funeral plant. Uh, I get questions time and time again on this plant um, because people give these to, uh, to people that are grieving you know, at funerals. And I think they do so because it's a beautiful plant and because they're easy to care for. Um, they like low to medium light situations, so perfect for our houses. Um, so a couple, a couple tips on growing them. We water them more frequently, you know, from spring through early fall. We want them to be in a high humidity such situation. And then to consider that they're sensitive to salts. So what does that mean? Um, the salts are that white crust buildup that you see on the top of your potting soil. Sometimes you'll even see it on the pot itself. Um, the salts are coming from your fertilizer. They could be coming from your water or th there may be some even in your potting soil. So it's quite normal for this to build up, um, but it seems to be a little harder on peace plant than on others. Uh, so the first thing you can do is remove the salt crust uh, from the top of the soil. You know, do that with a spoon or something. But the, the problem is that these salts make it harder for the roots to absorb water. Um, so it's really kind of an osmotic principle. We won't go into it, but just understand that it makes it harder for the roots to take up water so the plant starts to look like it's drying up. Uh, so one way to address this is we can leach our plants once or twice a year and put the plants, you know, in, in the sink or bathtub, you know, water it like normal until the water runs out allow the plant to drain for five minutes, and then water once again. Um, so what we're trying to do is get those salts, which are water-soluble, to leach out of the soil and to come out with the water that drains out. Now be careful with this. I wouldn't do this during the winter months. Um, I would do this at a time of year when it's much warmer and the plant can dry out faster. We just don't want to oversaturate the plant. But this is a way to leach out the salts during the warmer period of the year. Uh, another member of the Aram family is Chinese evergreen. Uh, 
And oh, there's so many beautiful cultivars on the market. This is one I have at home. Uh, there's another cultivar that I need to get that has kind of a red edge to it. Um, so there's just a lot to choose from as far as different patterns on the leaf. So Chinese evergreen is a great one for those of you that are starting out. The big thing to consider is that don't overwater this plant. This is the one that you need to make sure dries out between watering. So wait, you know, wait until the soil uh, has dried out a bit. So I talked about, um, you know, being careful not to not to sunburn your plant. Um, and in fact, you can sunburn your plant. It's no different than humans. When you sunburn the plant, essentially you're, you're kind of destroying the chloroplast or the chloroplast may even move out of that part of the leaf. It's kind of really interesting. But here, this is actually my own plant. I, I make plenty of mistakes. This is how I learn is by making mistakes. So I, this one leaf was actually getting direct sunlight um, and that's what burned it. So what I did was I've moved that plant away from the window. Um, the other thing you can do is you can put it behind a lacy curtain. So if you're, um, if you happen to have, you know, kind of sheer curtains, um, that will still allow light to get through, but it'll be less likely to burn the plant. You know, other arums to consider, we've got Swiss cheese plant on the left. Now, I love that one. It's kind of a fun one. Um, you do need to trellis it a little bit because it is a vine. Now, for those of you that have, trop have tra uh, traveled to tropical rainforests, you'll see that the Swiss cheese plant is quite a vigorous vine. I've seen it grow up a 60-foot tree, no problems. That's what it would do in its native environment. It's not going to grow that, that fast in your house, but you will need to kind of train it a little bit on a trellis. Now the middle plant is a dumb cane, and the dumb cane is, is kind of a nice tree-like plant. It does have that nice stem on it. Um, and then golden pothos. For a while, golden pothos was kind of passe among plant enthusiasts, and that's because it, it's so easy to grow. But, you know, I think that's a great thing uh, to have a plant that's really low maintenance. This is a plant that you can grow in an office environment that has fluorescent lights without any outdoor windows. It, it, it can certainly take that. All right, going on to my next family, um, the bromeliads. This is kind of one of my favorite families. This is the pineapple family of all things. Now we have different kinds of bromeliads, so you may want to take a look. Does it grow in the soil, or is it an epiphyte that would grow more uh, that would grow um, in in something that's more well drained, like a bark media? Now, one thing that a lot of the bromeliads have in common is they have what is called a tank. So this is a cup where the rosette foliage comes together and it kind of creates a little depression that would collect water if it was outdoors. Um, there, there's it's kind, of, um, kind of an evolutionary advantage to having a, a tank. You can in fact catch insects in it. The plant benefits by this. So if you have an insect that drowns and decays in there, there, there's a small amount of nutrients that would then be available for the plant. So that's why bromeliads have that cup or tank. So with the bromeliads, uh, this is another one to make sure you don't overwater. Uh, for those of you that are a little on the fence about bromeliads, you know, maybe consider neglecting the plant just a little. You'll actually have a little bit better, ch uh, a better chance with the plant. So just don't overwater it. Um, now during the summer months, you should place water in the cup. Um, but make sure it's good quality water. If you have a lot of salts in your water, if you have a lot of chemicals, don't use that. Then you might want to consider substituting distilled water. Um, but you could do this, you know, uh, keep the water in there in spring, in summer, early fall, but take it out by late fall. Um, this would actually increase the chance of, of, of rotting the plant in the winter. So this is, this is one of those plants you put water in the cup, um, but just during um, the warm season. And then make sure that you replace the water about once a week. So here's a, brom a beautiful bromeliad called Talansia cyanea. Um, I actually grow this one at home. This is kind of a fun one. It has that beautiful pink flowering stalk and the actual flowers are those little purple things. 
Now, with our bromeliads, they have an interesting life cycle. They will die after flowering, but they'll give you a little bit of time, maybe six to 12 months. And in that time, they will, provi they will produce what we call a pup or a little daughter plant. So that's a little offshoot that will come off the base of the plant. So you want to you want to be able to grow those pups until they're a little bit bigger in size. Then you can sever them with a knife and then root them in some potting soil to produce the next plant. Whoops, I think. One thing I forgot to mention, and I think it might even be missing from here, is how to get your plants to flower. Um, bromeliads are kind of interesting. Um, you, you may want to consider wh what it took to get a pineapple to flower in the old days. Uh, so they used to have to grow pineapple fields right next to the sugarcane field. Um, and they, we know they burn sugarcane fields. It was actually the burning of the sugarcane field that would induce the pineapple plant to flower. Now we, we have since figured out what the mechanism is. By burning something, we are producing ethylene gas. Um, and ethylene gas is something given off by apples. Um, so what you can do to get a bromeliad to flower is enclose it in a plastic bag and put an apple or two in it. The apple will produce ethylene gas. That's why we say that an apple, um, one, ba one bad apple spoils the bunch. It's because it's producing this gas. Now, if you enclose the apple with the bromeliad in a clear plastic bag, you know, do so for about seven to 10 days. Leave maybe just a little corner of the bag open to allow there to be a little air exchange, but we do want to concentrate the ethylene gas. That will then induce the bromeliad to flower. And then this is our most famous bromeliad, uh, the pineapple. We're going to move on to the ficus or fig family. So these are all in the same genus, ficus. They're just different species. We're going to talk about fiddle leaf fig, um, the rubber plant, and weeping fig. Now, fortunately, this family is not toxic to cats and dogs. Probably the trendiest of all houseplants right now is that fiddle leaf fig. Do you know what I'm talking about? You open, up a, you open up the magazines, and I swear there's one of these in every house shoot that they do in the interior design magazines. Uh, so these plants can be spendy. I've seen um, a good size fiddle leaf fig for sale in Fargo for $300. Um, I think the plant that's pictured here would probably be a $500 plant. Fortunately, you can go to a big box store and maybe buy a plant that's only a foot high and then grow it. Um, to, to four to five feet high. That's a lot more reasonable. I purchased one for about $20 and within a year, you know, I, I've got about, uh, I've got a plant that's about four feet tall. Um, now these are very interesting. Um, it has kind of an architectural structure to this plant. Um, it's it's tree-like and then it has these big coarse leaves that look like a violin. So these look absolutely fabulous in a home. Um, so fiddle leaf fig does like high humidity, so it's a good thing to group it with other plants or have a room humidifier. And then it needs medium light, not low light. Uh, so here we have it in an east-facing window uh, in Lofsgard Hall, and it's doing just fabulously. Um, now, I wouldn't put this in the hottest summer sun that could in fact burn it, but you know, being close to an east facing window should be pretty good or a few feet away from the west facing window. Um, now with these big leaves, they're gonna trap dust. And I'm sure you've seen dust on your house plants, so it's a good idea to wipe them. You don't have to buy a commercial product, just take a damp cloth and then wipe them clean. So this is very important for a couple, for many reasons. You know, first it looks better to have a plant that's dusted, but it's also helping the health of your plant. If there's a thick layer of dust, that's going to reduce the amount of light that is hitting the plant, which would reduce the plant's ability to photosynthesize and make its own carbohydrates. So we want to remove that layer of dust. Um, this. Another benefit is that by doing so, you may be removing some of the spider mites. You're wiping the spider mites off the plant. That's a good thing. 
Um, now, one caution is this only applies to leaves that are smooth. You don't want to do this on a hairy leaved plant like an African violet. All right, so another cousin of the fiddle leaf fig um, is the rubber plant. So the rubber plant, I, this was so popular in the 1970s. I know my mom really wanted one of these, and I don't know why we never got one, but these were just so popular. They're popular again um, because they've got these beautiful oval glossy leaves. They're dark green, um, and they do have that tree-like form to them. Now, this requires at least medium light. Um, supplemental light is probably a good thing if you can, if you can provide that. Um, rubber plant likes the soil moist but not sopping wet. Um, if you're not providing enough light to your plant, you're going to know. You're going to notice that the lower leaves drop off of that plant. That's how you know in a lot of situations if your plant is not getting enough light. If you're losing those bottom leaves, the plant is shedding them on purpose because it just can't photosynthesize enough, it can't produce enough carbs to produce or to feed the plants on the bottom. This plant uh, is called rubber plant. Um, now, this does not pr produce real rubber, but it does exude this latex-like substance if you break the branch. So I wanted to show you what a rubber plant looks like in the wild. It's this massive tree. So that's just something to think about, particularly if you've got a house plant that's a tree. Google, Google it and see what it looks like in the wild. I think you will be absolutely astonished. Um, you know, fiddle leaf fig is another one that, that grows to be pretty tall, as does our weeping fig or ficus benjamina. So ficus benjamina will grow to be about 100 feet tall in the wild. Um, so why is it only going to grow to be about six to eight feet tall indoors? Well, there are a lot of reasons. First of all, your plant is not going to be getting as much light, but you also need to think about the root system. That root system is in that little pot. It only has a little bit of soil. Um, and, and frankly, when you are restricting the roots, that's what we call bonsai. So in actuality, our weeping figs and our other house plants that we grow that are growing to six or eight feet tall that would otherwise grow to be 100 feet tall in the wild are essentially bonsai. So just something to think about. Uh, so our weeping fig, absolutely beloved by many people, it does require at least a medium light situation. But I would bet a lot of you out there would say that the weeping fig is kind of persnickety, wouldn't you say? Um, I would tell people, if your weeping fig is growing really well, just leave it. Don't change anything you're doing. You've hit that sweet spot. Um, we do find that weeping fig is susceptible to leaf, leaf drop if you move it. Um, so if, you're, if your plant is doing well, just don't touch it. I think it, it's happy the way it is. Now be careful. Don't underwater your weeping fig. If you underwater it, you're your tree is going to assume that it's the dormant season and may lose its leaves. Um, so if you're noticing that the leaves are starting to turn yellow and starting to drop, your plant may be underwater, underwatered and the plant may, may want to go dormant. All right, our last family is the orchid family. All right, so a lot of botanists, um, I think this is kind of an amusing family because there are over 24,000 species and 880 genera. So botanists say this is a promiscuous family. Well, there's certainly been a lot of crossing and hybridizing in the wild. And um, in cultivation, there are over 100,000 registered cultivars. So there's been a lot of plant breeding done. So, so we're... we're uh, an orchid obsessed uh, world. So it, it's, it's really kind of fun. But a fun thing to think about is that vanilla beans come from orchids. Um, have you noticed that the price of vanilla is just kind of skyrocketed? Well, um, think about um, the importance of pollinators when it comes to, the, comes to this particular orchid. The vanilla orchid is native to South America and it's pollinated by one specific bee. However, most of the vanilla is produced in other, in other areas of the world, like Madagascar. I mean, I've even, 
I heard, I've heard of a vanilla farm in Hawaii. They don't have the right bee. So think about it. You're going to have to have somebody tediously hand pollinating these orchids to get the vanilla beans. And to top it off, um, we recently had a crop failure from Madagascar. So that's why you're going to notice that your vanilla at the store is just sky high in price. All right, so that was, that was my little tangent. We're going to go back to orchids. Orchids are kind of fascinating. Um, so I've got a picture here of the seeds. The seeds are microscopic. They're really interesting because they don't have endosperm. So they really don't have carbs to nurse that seed as it's germinating and growing. Instead, that germinating seed has to rely upon uh, a relationship with a fungus called a mycorrhizae. So it develops a symbiotic relationship where the fungus actually nourishes the seedling as it's growing. And then in turn, as the orchid becomes established, the orchid is able to nourish the fungus. So that's an example of a symbiotic relationship. But it also shows you that it's going to be really, really difficult to start orchids from seed. We're going to talk about two orchids, Phalaenopsis. Uh, the moth orchid is probably the most commonly grown orchid. It's the one that's easiest to grow. So we're going to come back to the term epiphytic, meaning that it does not grow in soil. Um, you would find a moth orchid perched on the branch of a tree in the rainforest. Um, so think of the orchid as, in fact, you know, receiving rainfall and then drying out quite fast in between rains. So that's why we don't want to grow it in soil. Um, we have a special mix I'm going to talk about. Um, interesting about some of the moth orchids is that the leaves, I'm sorry, the petals will change color um, once the flower has been pollinated. So this is the flower's way of signaling to the bee, hey, I'm already pollinated. You could move on to the next plant. So Phalaenopsis, really easy to grow. Um, one thing is, you know, make sure you don't grow it in direct sunlight. So you want to move it, you know, a couple of feet from the window, particularly during the hottest part of the summer. So this is going to be a plant that does well in low light situations, and it doesn't like cold temperatures. However, it does need a temperature drop in fall. That's what initiates flowering in the plant. So when it comes to caring for orchids, they have special needs. They really need high humidity. So everything I talked about before still applies, but there's another way of raising the humidity around the plant. You can buy a special orchid tray or gravel tray. With the orchid tray, um, you put water in it, and then you put the pot on top, of, um, on top of the tray. You don't want the bottom of the pot sitting in the water, but you do want water evaporating all around the plant to increase the humidity. Now, there's special orchid trays out there, or you could just take a saucer and put like river rock or gravel in it. Um, once again, you put the pot on top of that, but you make sure that you put water in the bottom of the saucer to a level where it's not, not touching the bottom of the pot. We don't want the roots to sit in water, otherwise they're going to rot. So instead, we just want rel high relative humidity around the plant. Um, so as I mentioned, allow the roots to dry between waterings. Um, now, what about ice cubes? So we see on Pinterest and some of these other websites you, that you can water an orchid with ice cubes. Well, I'll tell you what. I've got a colleague from the University of Georgia that thought this was, uh, that this was some really bad advice. So he thought he would just run a quick experiment. He had everything he needed. So he's like, okay, I'm just going to run this experiment. And what he found is that it's okay to water an orchid with three to four ice cubes, you know, assuming, um, you know, a decent sized pot. What happens is that the ice cubes melt very slowly, which provides water to the roots. Um, but the water, or the, I should say the, the water that's melted from the ice cube has time uh, to come up in temperature before it, hurts, before it hurts the root system. So you can, in fact, water your orchid with ice cubes. Now, I wouldn't put like a ton of them, but, you know, we're talking like three to four in a decent-sized pot. Um, 
So that kind of blew my mind, but it's, but it's showing you we're still studying and we'll, we're still learning um, about how to take care for our plants. All right, with orchids, we never want to use a standard potting mix. We want to use something that drains far faster than a standard potting mix. So you can buy a specific uh, bag of orchid media, or you can make your own. Um, it's usually kind of a, a combination of 80% bark with 20% sphagnum moss. Um, and then remember to transplant your orchids when the pot is full of roots and when you start to notice that the bark in the media is starting to break down into small pieces. We don't want it to break down too much because otherwise it will hold too much water. And then our final orchid is Dendrobium. Now this is harder to grow than Phalaenopsis. This is what you can graduate to once you have successfully grown Phalaenopsis, then you can try Dendrobium. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that this does need about twice as much light as Phalaenopsis. So you might want to consider growing this in a south-facing window with a sheer curtain, um, or you may want to consider um, supplemental lighting. With dendrobium, you do want to grow them drier than Phalaenopsis. That's because of how the plant is structured. You'll notice that it has stems, so it looks different than, um, than Phalaenopsis. Now, these stems happen to have the ability to hold water, so you don't have to water dendrobium as often as you do Phalaenopsis. So I wanted to end with... Um, just some plant recommendations. I do get a lot of calls from, I, I get a lot of questions from people that want to know whether plants are toxic to dogs and cats. Now this is just a, a small list of some of the plants that are not toxic to dogs and cats. If you want a more complete list, um, go to the ASPCA.org for more information. Now if you're looking for a list of plants, uh, that are poisonous to humans, you could go to poison control, you know, Google poison control and list of toxic plants, and you'll find a good resource there. So it's good, it's good to be careful if we have pets or if you're running a daycare or have children around. All right, I think that's my last slide, and I will entertain questions at this point. Well, you had a couple questions come in. Okay. So Judy has two questions. I have read that it is unnecessary to fertilize plants, that the fertilizer really doesn't benefit the plants. What are your thoughts about this? Well, that's a pretty general statement. I do find that, um, that plants do need some fertilizer, and that, that's particularly with the house plants. They're grown in a potting soil, and the potting soil really is not a source of nutrients. So over time with watering, you know, like around once a week, you're going to leach whatever nutrients are there out. So you will need to fertilize, but it, it's kind of very infrequently. I think people over-fertilize, to tell you the truth. But one way to tell if your plant is under-fertilized is if the leaves are starting to turn yellow. If they're starting to turn yellow, that's a sign that your plant has a nitrogen deficiency. But I would agree with you on one point that we do over-fertilize our plants. We, we could get, a by, get by with fertilizing them uh, very infrequently. All right, the next question, and I could chime in. I'm looking at my office plant. <laughs> okay. How should you treat plants that have brown tips? Should you cut the section of the leaf that is brown or will this put stress on the plant? All right, so with leaves that have a brown tip that's really frequent at this time of year, that may be a sign that you have low humidity in the area. You know, frankly, I don't worry, I wouldn't cut, I wouldn't cut off the leaf unless it's really unsightly because the rest of that leaf is still photosynthesizing. The rest of that leaf is still green and still, um, still doing its job. So unless it's really bothering you, I would just leave it. Um, and, and you may notice that as summer comes around that you'll have fewer of these tips. Um, the other thing that could be causing this is sometimes when we have those high levels of salts, that may make it harder for the plant to take up water, and we may notice that. And someone asked about growing ivy. She has a hard time growing ivy. Do you have any suggestions? Okay. Um, 
I have to admit I've had I've had pretty decent luck with ivy, maybe growing it drier. The other thing I've noticed with ivy is that it, they can sometimes be susceptible to spider mites. So maybe that, that may be the problem that you're encountering. So you may want to treat the spider mite situation. And you know, probably the easiest, least toxic way of handling that would be to use insecticidal soap. So I do have a publication here that has various insecticide and um, other types of treatments. I don't know if you can see it, but it's called Growing House Plants um, and Management of Pest Problems. This is available through um, NDSU Extension publications. It should be online. But we do have a lot of good recommendations for taking care of things like aphids and spider mites. Um, so, I, I, so I'm hoping I answered the ivy question. And is that publication you just held up, is that on our website? Yes. OK, so we will get that linked if it isn't already on the Field to Fork website, along with the archived presentation that Esther just finished. And also her slides in a PDF format will be on the Field to Fork website. And then Kay says, I have trimmed the leaves of a peace lily, giving it a new tip, and it seemed to work for me. Oh, so, good thanks, to Thanks, Kay. Any other questions before we wrap up today? I think we all want spring and summer. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> well, I will um, close out our seminar today. Thank you for joining us, and please join us for the upcoming webinars. Next week, we are going to learn more about fruit and the kinds of fruit that will grow well in North Dakota, according to the research. So thank you, everyone, and thank you, Esther. That was very thank interesting. Thank you, Julie, for having me.